Let's start. So for those that don't know, that I'm pretty sure that everyone here knows, you've been working in the comic industry for how many years now? Uh, about 45 years. I started around 1971. I came directly out of the military and uh, went to New York City after a little stint at a public college and uh, got work at Marvel. Uh, effectively became their art director. They never had one before and so they said, well, we need somebody to do corrections and cover sketches for other artists to do and so I came in there and they put me work right away and uh, I've been working in the comic books on and off ever since then. Uh, I have a couple of things. There's a, a reprint of the uh, Life in Art and Pictures and Words uh, that uh, came out a few years ago. That's going to be reprinted. And I have another art uh, book called uh, Black Book that's coming out through Sleeping Giant slash Ominous Press. And I'm talking to some other people about some other projects here and there. Nothing definite yet that I can announce at this time, but there, I haven't retired. Well, the, the one that's the Black Book from Amadis has all this really obscure stuff that never got printed or never seen much of light of day. Uh, there's actually an eight-page Zazam Captain Marvel story that I drew and uh, wrote the scripts out in it, but it's colored all up. And it, the entire eight pages, including the cover, are inside this book. So it's going to be something no one's ever seen before. Similar, more or less, to the one that five years ago. Very much the same format, yes. So, you have a question? No questions? Nobody? Emilio has a question. All right. All right, Emilio. In the meantime, I'll sing you uh, Moon River, and, uh, <laughs> do a little dancing and carry it on, and uh, see? ask me another question. Another question. Let me see. Huh. Um, I've already asked you how many years you've been working in the industry, how new projects, uh, how you've been liking it so far. I feel like I'm not prepared for this one. Uh, let's see. I'm a little bit intimidated right now. Let, Let me tell you about uh, when I first started working up at Marvel. I started working with Stan Lee. And uh, they needed somebody to do little sketches for other artists like Gil Kane and John Buscema, the really good artists, to uh, do the finished pencils on. And uh, this is one of my favorite stories of working with Stan because Stan was wanted to be an actor. And uh, his uncle, who owned Marvel Comics, said, no, you're a 16-year-old, you can't go off and become an actor, you've got to become the editor of all our Marvel Comics instead. And so Stan was always frustrated. So when I would bring in the sketches in the morning after, you know, doing them up, he would come in and he'd look at them and go, terrific, terrific, but... And then he would take off his glasses and he would put them on the seat and then he would literally crawl up on his desk and he would act out how he wanted the Silver Surfer to be on the cover. And about every fifth time after he got done doing this, he would come down and he would sit on his glasses and break them. <laughs> He would then hit a button on his intercom and go, Holly, I did it again. <laughs> she would run in with a new pair of glasses, give it to him, take the old ones off to the optometrist. And this was something I did for like months on months, watching Stan go through these glasses. <laughs> Do we have sound now? Hey, how are you doing? How are you? Hey, uh, well, I mean, I don't have a question for you. I just want to lay down a small comment saying that uh, I saw Avengers Infinity War twice. Some of the people are actually crying. You can barely hear him. Let me let me check with the sound guy real quick. Because it's not, not, not really good. Let's try it one more time. Yes. Yeah. Uh, not so close to it. Back. Just a little. There we go. Try it there. Yeah, uh, I saw the movie Infinity War twice, 
and uh, oh, uh, this is not a question, just a small comment. Uh, all I have to point out is that uh, some of the people, or pretty much people who are reacting to the video, have uh, you know, at, the, at the end of the movie, they pretty much left crying. The movie? Yeah, twice. Twice. Okay. That was my next, my next, next question. I think I already uh, uh, read something about the reaction about it. But um, did you, you just said you just watched the movie two times, right? Did you like, did you like the, the interpretation of the of, of Donna? Yes. I will get back to your question in a moment. I hit his first. Uh, I really did love the movie. Uh, because there were so many characters in the Infinity Gauntlet book that weren't in the movie, I didn't expect a carbon copy thing, so I wasn't sure what to expect. Uh, I kept praying that it was going to be a good movie, because uh, if any of you remember the 1960s Batman TV series, I kept praying that it wasn't going to be like that. <laughs> because I could just imagine Bob Kane having to say, oh yeah, I really loved it. And even though it was just the antithesis of everything you did, but uh, I got really lucky. I was at the other end of the spectrum, so I, I got in there and I was so blown away by the movie that afterwards, we went to the premiere, and afterwards there was a party and I had both directors, and one of the directors and both of the writers ask what I thought about it, and I was so blown away and tongue-tied that I came off like the village idiot. <laughs> Uh, but I just thought they did a terrific job. Uh, a number of the things that they had to change, I approved the changes on them entirely. Uh, in fact, I was very surprised that the whole different motivation of the overpopulation thing was something that I, re I wrote years ago. I forgot all about it. Uh, some article had to tell me that the overpopulation thing was something I had written in Silver thir Surfer 34 or 35. Uh, but no, I just loved the movie. I loved what they did with it. I loved Brolin's interpretation of it. He wasn't on my radar at all as being Thanos because I thought it was just going to be a voiceover job. But now that I saw him and the, everything you saw Thanos do in the movie, Josh Brolin did. Every movement, every uh, inflection of his face, uh, they captured it all on computer. Every day he had to go in there with about 30 pounds of gear on his shoulder with a stick coming up his back and had a tennis ball on the top so they could show how tall he was supposed to be in the scene. So they would take this computerized uh, virtual Thanos or virtual Josh Brolin, turn it into Thanos and then replace him on the screen. Uh, I just loved the way he moved, the way he walked in it. Uh, everything about it was just right. I can't imagine anybody else playing him at this point. And as for your reaction, uh, the reaction of people to the movies, was it about how other people reacted or my reaction to it? The audience's yeah, reaction. Yeah, the audience. Uh, it was kind of interesting. The first time we went to see it, we went to see it with everybody who had worked on the movie. So most of them actually hadn't seen anything of it. Uh, apparently, Zoe Saldana, uh, was so upset with their, her big scene with Thanos that she uh, got up and left the theater. Uh, you know, she had not seen it before. It really just stunned her that much. Uh, a lot of other people, uh, plus the directors and the writers, they lied to everybody about what the movie was about. So a lot of the people who thought they had, had expectations of how the movie was going to be were surprised when they sat down there and did it. Uh, if you look through the trailers, they went so far as to fake a scene in Wakanda where Captain America and everybody's running forward. And if you look in the background, there's the Hulk. Yeah. And he's not in the scene. They no. faked that out so badly. What happened? Well, they never had him planned on being in there. They, they did the fake scene with him running with the rest of them just so nobody would expect him to be inside the uniform instead. Yeah, so pretty much he was replaced by, uh, uh, by Iron Man, the Hulk was the Hulkbuster. Yeah. And one last thing, uh, the movie drops a bomb. Bomb. The movie was a bomb? <laughs> he said the movie drops a bomb. It dropped a bomb. Okay. Yeah, it drops the bomb to anyone who is a fan of the franchise. Um, 
if the amendment didn't work right, I kind of disagree, but I think that if it was a surprise, yeah, I think a lot of people were surprised. Oh, okay. In a good way. In a good way. Yes, I think so, too. All right, all right. Yeah, was that kind of confusing? It's breaking all sorts of box office records. In Hollywood, the bomb means it didn't sell. All right. Mr. Tully, my name is Emilio. I have one little question. 1982, Arrow Comics published their first graphic novel, The Death of Captain Marvel, written and drawn by you. My question is, are you satisfied with the final product of that graphic novel? Did you get to say all you wanted to say in that particular graphic novel? Oh, you never get to say everything you want to say. There's only so many pages. Um, but that was kind of an interesting job because Marvel Comics didn't know what to do with Captain Marvel at that point. Um, Captain Marvel was always a real problematic sell. Uh, the early Captain Marvels didn't sell very well. Um, the Gil Kanes and Roy Thomases sold pretty well for those two or three issues, but the earlier issues had died so quickly that they canceled the book before it could really get going. And when I came onto the book, they had had two or three issues come out by some other writer and artist, and they didn't sell worth it at all. So when they gave me the Captain Marvel job originally, they said, well, this may be for one issue because the book is probably going to get canceled at any moment. But it started selling again, so they kept the book and I did my run. But afterwards, they had other people write in it, and most of the time, the sales were very bad. So they decided they wanted to kill off that Captain Marvel and uh, bring around this uh, female character who uh, eventually became Photon. Uh, they approached me and asked me if I would kill Captain Marvel off. Uh, I cut a deal with them where I would do their book if we did the Red Star graphic novel afterwards. So it was sort of a if trade off, you know, I'll scratch your back or scratch mine. So I had to figure out how to kill him off. And I went and I, I, I think I wrote about four, maybe five different plots where Captain Marvel dies and some heroic thing at the end. And I hated them all. I kept throwing them out and I'm going, what am I going to do? And then it hit me, my, my own father had passed away from cancer about a year before. And uh, the gears just started working and I wrote out the plot, sent it into Marvel. Jim Shooter, the editor-in-chief, loved it. All his assistant editors hated it because they wanted him to die off in some heroic way, which I didn't want to do. Uh, I think Jim made the right choice by letting me go with what I'm doing because we went through nine printings and uh, it keeps on getting reprinted in some form or another ever since then. So uh, I think we've made the right choice in killing him off in this particular matter. Thank you very much. Hello, my name is Jose, and I wanted to ask you, uh, before Infinity War, what was your favorite Marvel movie? Before Infinity War, uh, probably the Guardians movies. I just get a kick out of them. So. Yeah, maybe even the second one more than the first one. I, 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 they, and plus, they have the best after parties. <laughs> yeah, yeah, it's working, it's working. Uh, my question is, uh, based on like the feud of DC Comics fans and Marvel fans, from your point of view, who will win in a fight? Your Phantom or Dark Side? Oh, that's a real easy one. Whoever struck first. <laughs> Uh, who was still standing at the end. <laughs> he was the one who was struck first. So, you mean, like, you mean that? If that was struck first, he would have been the one standing. Okay. Both dirty dogs, you know. Hi, my name is Jose Reyes. Uh, what was your source of inspiration when creating Thanos and the Infinity Gauntlet? 
Okay, uh, Thanos was very easy. Uh, I got out of the service and I was taking some community college classes. And one of the classes I took was a psychology class. And uh, the professor gave this lecture one day about the uh, dark and the light side of uh, human nature, the heroes and Thanos. And I perked up on the Thanos and uh, ran with it. Uh, the Infinity Gauntlet, on the other hand, uh, my first eight years of schooling were at a, a Catholic parochial school where I had to go to church six days a week. Uh, so I had a lot of religion pounded into me early on in life. And the whole idea of omnipotence of a God who could do anything, you know, was something that was drilled into us every day, every day, God is all this, God is all that, and I thought, the wonder of God was insane. And that's where the, uh, the, uh, the gauntlets came from. Uh, Roy Thomas and Gil Kane had already done the soul gem on top of uh, Adam Warlock's forehead. Uh, just as a throwaway bit in one of an Avengers stories, I threw in the rest of the Infinity Gems and they just sat around for a couple of years until uh, Steve Englehart started using them in Sofa Surfer came in and took over to Silver Surfer after that, and uh, everything just sort of developed. Uh, I wanted to do a mad god, and we turned Thanos into him. What is your favorite Marvel Cinematic Universe performance? The single of the performance? Cinematic performance. Okay, uh, by a single actor or actress? Yeah. Um, I'd say uh, Dave Bautista has sort of just edged out <laughs> Zoe Saldana by just a little bit. I mean, they're doing two different things entirely, but those two are the ones that I get the biggest kick out of. Uh, just because David Bautista, you will take a look at him, who would think that he was a comedic actor? He is funny, you know, and, uh, and Zoe Saldana is so intense and sincere about what she's doing with uh, Gamora that I'm just sort of, uh, you know, enthralled by what she's doing, especially in this latest movie. But those are the two big ones for me. Uh, I mean, Brolin's up there really good now, too, but I think maybe it's still Batista. Thank you. You're welcome. Yeah, he's so deadpan and droll about it, but at the same time, he's hilarious, you know. How long have you been standing there? Oh, I can, I can just stand so still that it, nobody sees me. <laughs> really? <laughs> uh, hi, my name is Ryan. Um, my question is, when you take over a character or take over a storyline or whatever, what is your strategy for kind of maintaining what was established before you and then putting your own aside? Okay. Uh, what happens uh, when I take over somebody else's character? Uh, it depends on the situation. Uh, with something like Captain Marvel, they wanted change. They wanted something that was going to sell. So I felt I had a free reign with something like that. On the other hand, if I do a Superman or Batman story, I can't break the, to the toys and put them back in the box broken. So if I do something really outrageous with them, i got to put them back into some kind of order at the end of the story. Uh, basically, whenever I approach a story, I want a character to take a trip. He's got to start off at point A, and I want to get him to say like point E, and the interesting parts are him getting to B, C, D, and what have you. Um, I like to have them a little bit changed by the time the story ends, so that they're not exactly at the same point that they were to begin with. There's only one story I ever did that was like that. It was the second issue of The Thing 2-in-1, where I had him walking out of the desert at the beginning of the story and walking out of the desert at the end of the story. <laughs> Nobody liked that for some reason. I didn't know. Thank you. You're welcome. Uh, would you 
do talk about what money we're going to donate the panels and everything. poster that they are selling here at Comic Con and other efforts that we have worked during the years for helping here. What was that again? Uh, he can comment about the Bad Mogi bag and him to donate the poster, the panels and the poster that they're selling. Oh, 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 that was just seemed the right thing to do, that's all. Okay. Uh, there, is there any hope that we get a Dread Star series? We were talking to people about Dread Star and uh, different levels, uh, but I have nothing to announce on that at this point. But Dread Star is not completely dead yet. Thanks. Our former producer is dead, but, you know. <laughs> oh, yeah, yeah. We, we, we had the TV show all set up, and he died on us. <laughs> Hi. Hello. I'm Monica, and I guess my question is that, so, it used to be more common in comics to, for characters to be more uh, combative, I guess, or in their dialogue, in the way that they to like show their grandmother, especially cosmic characters. So my question is, uh, have you ever felt pressured or overly conscious as the years pass on and the comic book style changed, like as an industry, for example, how characters are yeah, edited and presented? Yeah. Have you ever felt pressure to, no. oh, I have to yeah. write these characters like this now. I have to write cosmic characters in this way now because that's what Okay, um, comics are pop, are pop culture. Uh, things are always changing. Uh, comics are much different when I first started off reading them to when, they, when I started actually working on them. There was a big change at that point in the 1970s, and there's been a lot of changes since then. Uh, do I have pressure? put on to me to do certain things. I do, and that's when I quit working on those projects. Um, the pressure I usually get is whatever I think I should be doing. Uh, I'm my worst, uh, most of the time I'm my, my harshest editor. Uh, I have worked some, with some very good editors like Roy Thomas, Archie Goodwin, and uh, a few others, Al Milgram and a couple others, Bob Shrek. They're the ones who, they hire you to do a job because they know what they're going to expect from you to get, and they will try to help you do your best bet, but they will not try and pressure you into doing something that's not what you do. Uh, most of the time, looking back at it, I guess at this point, I think most of the time what I did was I tried to do my best story Looking back at certain points in the past, there are certain things that are dated. There, I go back and look at the Infinity Gauntlet. There's certain dialogue that was very up-to-date and uh, very flowing at that point that are, it's kind of clumsy now that I look at it, you know, 25 or 29 years later, whatever it was. Um, most of the time, there's not any, uh, there's nobody who's going to put pressure on me because they know how I work and what I work best is being left alone. And so, any pressure that comes is self-imposed. If that answers your question. Hello. Uh, Hello. I have a question related about Infinity War. Um, how was the process with the working with the Russo brothers? Was I involved in the Avengers movie? The next one. Well, I went down to the set and I had to sign something called a non-disclosure form. <laughs> and so I know a lot about the next movie, but I can't tell you because if I open my mouth, they send Mickey Mouse down here and he breaks my kneecaps. <laughs> So you're just gonna have to wait until next year. I'm sorry. Am I involved in that? I can't say. You just have to wait. But I'll tell you one thing. I got two credits in this movie. I'm shooting for three in the next. Whatever that means. And how were the Russo brothers? Of how did um, were there to the character Thanos? How were the Russo brothers? 
they were everybody on the movie set was really nice i got down there expecting them not to tell us anything because you know movies are really they've been really tight-lipped about it but what i didn't know is they've been working on it for two years and they've been dying to talk to somebody about it so as soon as we got there they called us off uh, over in the corner and they told us everything <laughs> Uh, they were really nice. Uh, I didn't meet, uh, I, uh, I met uh, Anthony Russo. I didn't meet Joe at the time because he had pneumonia when we were down at the set. Uh, the two writers, Stephen and Chris, uh, they were very friendly. Uh, they explained why they were doing things, uh, what to expect, uh, you know, like they, they told me we can't do Mistress Death because Marvel doesn't want to use the abstract characters yet. And that was the reason she wasn't put in there. That's why you don't see Eternity and Infinity or any of these other characters yet. yet. I suspect you will as they do more Doctor Strange movies and more of those weird cosmic entities will come into the stories. So I expect that maybe down the line, because of Thanos' popularity in these two movies, we'll see more movies with him in it, in which case we'll see Mistress Death possibly. That's just a wild prediction on my part. No plans. Don't quote me and put me in the paper. <laughs> Hello, Miss Starling. Uh, I was wondering, if given the chance by DC or Marvel to work on any ongoing title or character, which one would you want to work on and why? None of them. I don't work for Marvel Comics anymore. We had a blowout here back in December, and uh, they're folks I can't trust, so we're not working together any longer. Any character you'd like to work on if they're getting a chance for anything to go be fixed, whether Marvel or DC? Um, you know, I've, I've done, been doing this 45 years. Anyone I wanted to really work on, I, I pretty much worked on already. Uh, so, you know, I'd like to do some more, I'm planning on doing some more Dread Star stuff. I mean, that's the character I want to work on in those. But uh, as far as the major companies, uh, no, there's no, nobody in particular I want to work on. I have a burning desire for it. All right, thank you. Welcome. you talk about uh, death in the family, your point of view? Talk about what? Death in the family. Oh, death in the family. Death in the family was really kind of fun. Um, I started writing Batman for Denny O'Neill, and uh, I never thought that anyone who was going to go out and fight crime should bring along a teenage boy and dress him up in bright primary colors while you're dressed all in these dark grays and hiding in the shadows. That's sort of like going, shoot the kid, shoot the kid. That's, that's not just dial in the abuse, that's child endangerment. So I always tried to leave Robin out of the stories because I just couldn't believe that you would do this. At the time that this was going on, uh, the AIDS epidemic broke out. And uh, DC had this comic, this idea that they were gonna give one of their characters AIDS and do a, an AIDS comic book based on this. So, they, so being the sensitive souls that they are, they put a suggestion box in the office, and everyone was supposed to put in a suggestion of what character should get AIDS. Being the sensitive soul I am, I stuffed it with Robins. <laughs> Unfortunately, they realized all the, thing, all the handwriting was the same, so they threw all the Robins out. And Jimmy Olsen ended up getting voted on to get AIDS. But then somebody told them that the actor who was playing Jimmy Olsen inside the Christopher Reeve Superman stories was gay himself. And so they all got scared. They, they abandoned the entire idea. But about two or three months later, Denny O'Neill came up with this idea about calling in on the phone things because it was a way for DC Comics to make a few bucks on these calls. And so he approached me because I had been saying, let's kill Robin, let's kill Robin. And he was saying, we can't do that. But then this idea came up, and he forgot about that we can't do that. And so we came up with the two different stories, uh, two different endings. It was only the last two pages of stories that were different. Um, I wrote them up, and Jim Apero, who was an artist I never met until years after we got done doing our Batman's runs. Uh, you know, he lived out in Connecticut. I lived in New York. Uh, I'd send in the scripts. He would go off and draw them, and we never met but we did this uh, really nice run together. So uh, 
when the final issues and when the books started coming out, I was actually spending some time down in Mexico. So I wasn't around at all. I couldn't even vote on this thing. I couldn't get a line into it. And uh, as it turns out, there was only like 72 different, 72 votes between life and death uh, out of 10,000. Statistically, this was a dead tie as far as the statisticians were concerned. Uh, basically, uh, they did the last book uh, when they started it off, uh, the whole series started it off. Denny O'Neill, who was the editor, uh, was on every morning talk show, news show, talking about this and saying what a great idea he had. And uh, Jim and I were never mentioned. So uh, that was okay, because that's his job. But after the books came out, all of a sudden, the licensing department, they realized they had all these pajamas and lunch boxes and thermoses with Robin's picture on it, and they hit the roof. And they said, this is a disaster. Somebody's got to pay for this. Whose fault is this? <laughs> Within two months, all my work at DC dried up. I did their best-selling book that year, and then within two months, I was out of work. <laughs> but it worked out okay, because I went over to Marvel Comics and started doing the Silver Surfer and Infinity Gauntlet and what happened. So this was an opportunity that uh, looked like a blunder at first, and it worked out just fine. That's for a story. Thank you. Uh, uh, I have a small secondary question. Uh, how do you feel when John Lennon brought back his car? When who? Brought him back, I said, the Red Hood. Um, didn't mean anything to me. I, I really wasn't paying attention to what the DC was doing at that point. I, I, I was actually working for them on Mystery in Space, but uh, Bob Shrek said they were bringing him back. I paid no attention to it. I know he's there, but it doesn't matter. Captain Marvel's still dead. That's all I care about. I have a quick question. You've been in the business for 45 years. How do you transform a good story into drawings? Good story into what? Drawings. 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 That's just drawings. Oh, oh, oh. Drawings. Drawings. Yeah. Okay. Um, I come up with the ideas, and what I usually do is I do little thumbnails. I get a loose leaf notebook pay, uh, book, and uh, I'll draw up four little squares. Each one's a page, and that is break down the panels that way, and I put little notes that says CM hits TH. That's Captain Marvel hitting Thanos. Uh, just little notes like that, just to break the story down. And uh, once I've got the entire book broke down like that, and this is the same way I'm working with Alan Davis on uh, on the new books. Uh, basically, just get the story in my head, break down the, the pacing and the visuals of what should be in each panel, and then I sit down and write panel descriptions, and after that I put in the dialogue. Uh, it's just the mechanics of it. Uh, if you're asking if there's some metaphorical, magic way that I can convert stories into visuals, uh, I can't answer that because that's a trade secret. <laughs> and there is no answer. <laughs> Thank you. Say that again? I understand you created Thanos. Oh, well, congratulations in creating one of the most um, human villains, I believe, because it definitely showcased someone that does believe in what he's doing and not caring about the means or the ends in order to get there. So, first... Um, he's complex. I wouldn't know it, say he was an actual human, though. In the sense or of... Or humane. Yes, in the sense of really believing what he's doing is what is best, and that is the way. And in another way, um, besides that, I wanted to know, I usually watch the movies and then get into the comics, and so therefore, I'm not really familiar with all the comics in terms of the history and everything behind it. I want to know, is there any particular reason why Thor has been um, beat up so much? Like lately, in history, I mean, like behind when they were creating the comics, where there's some, wasn't he selling enough or something? I, I do know that he later on ends up being a woman because she ends up getting the hammer. I don't know much about it. 
But why has he We have so much lately. Like, it's, it's almost heartbreaking, really. He's a difficult character to write because he's so powerful. You have to find even more powerful villains for him to fight. And so they beat him up to make him less powerful, thinking that that's going to make a better story. Uh, I don't think that usually works. Uh, he's been difficult in the movies, too, because the Thor movies have been the least successful of all the movies. Uh, so that's why they've done more experimenting, and that's why the last uh, Thor movie uh, was so different than the other ones, because they really wanted to break that formula and see if they could get something that would work better. And it did. They sort of made it into a Guardians movie. But uh, Thor himself, uh, I can't really tell you what's going on with the comic book uh, part of it because I don't have any dealings with that anymore. Um, I think they've made a lot of mistakes with him. You know, they did the, that strange diversity period where they changed all the characters into something else, like Captain America. The Falcon became Captain America. The Hulk became uh, some Korean guy. Um, and Thor became a woman. And, you know, it's nice that he had long, she had long hair still, but it wasn't Thor. And I think the thing is, you have to be true to the characters themselves. And if you want to do a female character, create a good female character. Don't trash the good guy that you have going there. Uh, if you can't, if the writer that you got writing on it is not doing good stories, get a better writer. Uh, but, you know, a lot of it in the comic right now is short-term thinking. They want to get a good quarterly report to the stockholders, and so that affects a lot of the stuff that's going on. It has changed quite a bit over the last 20 years. Yes, because it's, it's devastating that um, they create someone for you to look up to, Totally destroyed. Like, and then you're hoping that oh, he will get back on his feet. He'll get back on his feet. And then there's nothing else. Like, no Asgard, no people. Well, they eventually will get back because they're in the movies, and those become sort of the templates like that. So I think they've already started putting the male Thor back into the comic books, have they? Uh, I thought I remember hearing that somewhere. Yes. Yes. Uh, I know the Steve Rogers, Captain America again. You know, there's a certain core element to what these characters are that they will eventually get back to. You just have to suffer through when they're doing their little experiments. Um, um, my question is regarding, you mentioned your involvement with uh, the Russo Brothers and the Avengers of Infinity War. Now, did you have input into the script as it was? Or? No, no. They, uh, Marvel has made a sort of Chinese wall between the co comic books and the uh, movie people. And the way I see it going, it's probably not a bad thing to do. Because most of us comic people, don't, we don't know anything about movies or TV. Um, I had one guy who uh, had another character who was in one of these movies, and I brought him over, a cartoonist, uh, had a minor character in one of these movies, and I brought him over to the director to introduce him. And the first words out of the cartoonist was, why did you change my character so much? Okay, uh, this was a mistake. And so I can understand why they have these breaks between the, uh, the two divisions. Um, basically, it's, they're two different mediums, they're two different products, two different ways of handling things. And with the movies, it's so many moving parts. I mean, we just went down there for a very small scene that we, we sat around with, and it was in a room about the size of this, uh, this stage, and there was more than 100 people in there working. So, uh, and this wasn't even one of the big scenes, this was a little tiny scene. So, you gotta have the people who know what they're doing, doing what they're doing, and, you know, hope that they will handle it properly. And then in my case, with the Infinity Gauntlet, I think they handled it beautifully, so I have no complaints. Do you think that, uh... The, the movies will guide the comics in some way also, like the direction the time is going? Well, they will affect things. I mean, right now they are a big money maker. And so they will, it's a company, Marvel's a company. And so the people who work there will say, let's make the comics a little bit more like this, you know. But 
it'll always come back to what the core, if they're going to keep doing Thor comic books, it's going to come back to the central character who Thor is. It's the guy with the hammer. So eventually you'll get back to it. It's pop culture, folks. It changes. Good afternoon. My name is Jorge. Um, first of all, I want to take the liberty to thank you for 45 years of dedication to creating the most amazing uh, universe for a perfect childhood. I, I grew up reading comics and I thank you for that. Sorry I ruined your life like that. Oh, trust me, you didn't. My question is, since you've been all your life doing this, what is your personal position now that you're seeing these amazing characters that you worked on coming to life on the silver screen? What is my position? I'm still trying to determine that. Uh, I've only seen this movie twice, you know, at the premiere and then once since then. Um, intellectually, I know that the movie is based on this character and the story I wrote. Um, Emotionally, there's still this separation between the two. I mean, there was a whole crew of people who I had nothing to do with that did this movie, this tremendous looking, incredible piece of two and a half hour cinema. Uh, I know I had an inspiration and part of doing it. I see my two little credits there, but still there's a part of me that says, well, there's this and then there's that. And it's not a bad thing, it's just something that I'm still going through my head and trying to adjust to. Uh, it still has a very surrealistic feel to it at this point. Uh, you know, uh, I get up in the morning and nothing's changed from what it was six months ago. You know, I put my pants on just like I always do, throw them up in the air and jump into them. And, you know, it's just a matter of uh, my head is going to eventually adjust to it. You know, I love what they've done. I, this is not a complaint or anything. Uh, I'm just still having a hard time putting myself into the picture. You're welcome. Hello, Mr. Stern. Uh, where do you, well, I assume, where do you draw inspiration for most of your stories? Do you read a lot of history or other works of fiction? Uh, my stories come from everything. Uh, they come from books I read. Uh, Back during uh, the Warlock time, I was reading a lot of Castaneda and Wilhelm Reich, uh, Thor, I mean, excuse me, Thanos uh, came out of a lot of uh, my reactions to a lot of different things from a psychology class to years of parochial school to my time in the service to walking around in the woods, uh, talking to friends, uh, partying too much. I mean, this, all these things have something to do is something that came along. Uh, there's a character called Eon who was in the Captain Marvel uh, series. He was part of the metamorphosis where Captain Marvel makes that change. Eon came from a greasy bag that had, it was a garbage bag, and some trash had been thrown in it and a pattern that grew on the side of the, on the side of the garbage bag. It looked like Eon. So I sat down there and I drew it. I sketched it down and he became a character in the, Captain Marvel. So these, this stuff comes from everywhere. Yeah, I can't say this kind of, this is my source, this is my source. It's everything. And you just put, you, you find some way to make it all work together. No more questions? Have we killed off the hour? Can I go to lunch now? <laughs> A few more minutes. So we got I, 10 more minutes. Who's got a question? Somebody's got to have a question. How about you? Yeah, I have a question. Too. Where do you see the comic industry 10 years? Oh, 10 years from 10, 15 years, the future of comics. Um, I think we will probably get rid of the monthly book that's dying down the vine, even as we talk. I think it'll be more like graphic novels and uh, select miniseries. Um, I'm hoping the printed books still survives during that time because I don't enjoy sitting on the toilet reading my iPad. You know, I think the, the throne requires an actual paper. Um, 
You know, uh, I imagine the movies are going to continue to be a big money maker and a driver for us. Uh, they're also, you know, the television, the streaming rights, they're all factoring in. Marvel's just just pumping out character after character every, everywhere, you know. Um, and now with Fox and uh, Disney joining forces on the cinematic front and all that, that's going to even become more so, I think. Hi, Mrs. Darden. My name is Dennis. First of all, I want to thank you for writing the first comic book that blew my mind completely. Infinity Gauntlet number oh, five. Oh, another one I'm in trouble with. <laughs> Infinity Gauntlet number five, back in the day. So, thank you so much. And just a quick question. Uh, what are your plans for creator own work? Uh, do you have uh, something in mind for the future? Okay, uh, right now I have just finished off uh, a third novel inside a uh, series called Hardcore Station. Uh, Hardcore Station was a DC comic I did back in, I think maybe the 90s. Uh, it was a mess. It was a terrible mess, and, but I always liked the location, and so I've done uh, a novella and two novels, and I'm uh, working on the, the last uh, the four stories that are gonna be the whole thing. Uh, two of them are available and Amazon has ebooks at this point. Uh, Hardcore Mind Games is one of them, and the other one's called Lasgood's Boys. Uh, these are interconnected stories. You can read either one of those first. Uh, the Mind Games is about a telepath who is also a psychiatrist who uh, has been living on Earth, and uh, but the truth is that he was before he came here and set up this new life. He was a hardcore gangster in his fa family's uh, mobster business, and he managed to blackmail his father into letting him go. And 15 years later, his father was killed, and he's forced to go back to Hardcore Station to solve that murder. Uh, the other one, uh, Last Goods Boys, takes place mostly on Earth, though we will connect more back with Hardcore Station as we go along. And uh, it is about uh, three genetically altered uh, children who grow up to be uh, very different folks. One is the son of a uh, Korean entrepreneur businessman. Uh, the other is, uh, becomes a fa the son of a uh, Episcopalian minister uh, somewhere in the States. And the last one, uh, the parent that they were supposed to go off to got busted by what we call the weeds, who are the bad guys in the story. And he ends up growing up by being grown, uh, being raised by the, the sort of smuggler who was supposed to deliver him to his parents who couldn't. So these three children grow up to adulthood, very diverse backgrounds, and all start heading toward each other. And they're supposed to be, they were created to help mankind overthrow the weeds, but the way the story goes, it looks like they're all gonna try and kill each other off rather than do any good. And that's where the, the kicker in the story is. And if the other ones, the stories that are coming out after that will be continuations of those first two books. Thank you so much. I have another question. Are your way. Is there a, of all your uh, work, is there one in particular that you think you hold close to your heart that is your favorite work that you've done? That would probably be The Death of Captain Marvel, and my favorite Thanos story is the Thanos Quest.